in San Francisco, an ordinary flame shooting from a gas jet. In Lubbock, Texas, a rat grooming itself to the vibrations of Mozart. In Basel, Switzerland, gluey fluids dancing wildly across. All these are experiments in scientific laboratories, and each experiment helps to reveal another curious aspect of sound. tree falls in the forest, there's no one to hear it. Does it make any sound? This was a philosophic riddle in the 1700s. There is still no simple answer. We do know that a tree crashing in the forest creates waves in the air around it. Any vibration, even the smallest, creates waves in the air. But to become the sensation of sound, these waves must be picked up by an ear, and they must be processed by a living brain. We could not live our lives as we do without sound. We rely on sound for information, communication, order. Sound waves pursue us all the days of our lives. links to the outside world, sound may be the essential sense. A release of feeling, a message of approval, a statement of solidarity, all clearly understood in a ritual confusion of sound. Such are the manifold uses of sound, which, when it is within our range of hearing, tells us what's happening in our world. We measure the loudness of sound in units called decibels. 20 decibels, barely audible. My cousin. 75 decibels. One hundred ten decibels. At one hundred twenty decibels, the ear begins to feel pain. Physicians and psychologists believe that there is a point at which sound can be dangerous. In Tokyo, one of the largest and loudest cities in the world, people are warned that sound reaching a potentially harmful level by a street corner noise barometer. Awareness doesn't seem to lessen the din, and there is not yet a machine clever enough to turn down this cacophony of competing sound waves. All vibrations create waves of sound similar to waves in water. A pebble dropped in a still pond causes molecules of water to move against other molecules of water, which move against still others. The surface of the pond is disturbed by waves traveling outward until the original energy of the fallen pebble is dissipated. We live in a vast ocean of air continually agitated by vibrations of sound. If there were no envelope of air surrounding the Earth, sound could not travel, and the world would be as silent as the moon. 
an English scientist, Robert Boyle, in 1657 attempted to demonstrate that sound cannot travel without air. He built this air pump and dozens of others, elegant and inadequate. They failed to create a vacuum. In 1660, he did at last pump the air out of a glass jar. He proved his theory. The bell made no sound when it was rung in a vacuum. Boyle's experiment is part of almost every freshman physics course today. A glass jar, a bell, and an air pump. After 300 years, the same materials still demonstrate that sound needs a physical conductor. Sound travels through steel. Sound travels through air. Sound travels through string. Even water is a conductor of sound. Sound travels, but when it hits an obstacle, its course is changed. If we could take the roof off a concert hall and see the sound waves inside, we could watch them bouncing against the surfaces they hit. They are reflected, re-reflected, bounced back and forth, over, under, around, and against a listener whose ears catch some part of all these vibrations. The same principle, reflection, sometimes creates the phenomenon of echoes in such places as a Swiss valley. The sound comes bouncing back from mountains far away. The yodeler gets instant replays. We do not know yet what patterns sounds create in the invisible molecules of air. But in Switzerland, experimenters are studying patterns created in other materials by sound waves and vibrations. This tonoscope visualizes sounds of the human voice in patterns called sonorous figures. Dr. Hans Jenny hopes that by making vibratory processes visible, his investigations may provide an insight into some of the still elusive aspects of sound. Turpentine poured on a membrane and vibrated 100 times a second. The patterns are predictable. At this frequency, these materials invariably produce these patterns. Sand on a metal plate vibrated at a high frequency. The sand flows in swirling currents, which Dr. Yaney finds reminiscent of nebulae. An interaction of two liquids responding to vibration by moving in circular eddies. Sound as a creator of a visually aesthetic experience. A dance of iron filings moving like a congregation of medieval monks to the commands of sound. Without the aid of laboratory or engineering equipment, we cannot see the effects of sound. We rely mostly on the naked ear. All ears are designed to gather sound waves. However, they may seem to differ among elephants, bats, and jackrabbits whose ears are very efficient and swivel to locate the source of a sound. The human ear is not the most capable in the world, but even so, it is still a miracle of miniature engineering. Hearing begins when sound waves enter the outer ear and travel a canal to the eardrum. 
the eardrum vibrates, slowly for low tones and rapidly for high ones. In the middle ear, three small bones are stimulated by the movement of the eardrum. First, the hammer picks up the vibrations and passes them on to a second small bone called the anvil. The anvil sends the vibrations to the third bone, called the stirrup. Now the physical vibrations are converted to hydraulic pressures. Up to this point, sound is a mechanical phenomenon. Then, electrically, and finally electrochemically, these impulses are transmitted to the brain, where they are experienced as the sensation of hearing. A young human ear can perceive sound ranging in frequency from a low of 20 to a high of 20,000 cycles or vibrations per second. The more frequent the vibrations, the higher the pitch of the tone. Television sets do not reproduce sound anywhere near the capability of an efficient human ear to receive it. Dogs hear sounds both lower and higher than the human ear can. Cats also hear sounds higher than we can, but they cannot hear this tone, which is lower than 60 cycles per second. Humans hear better in the lower frequencies than most other animals. On the other hand, most other animals hear high sounds better than we do. Some exceptions, the crocodile whose ears do not respond to sound above 6,000 cycles per second. And the grasshopper, hearing stops at 15,000 cycles per second. Few animals hear so well in the upper frequencies as the porpoise. The porpoise can hear high sounds so efficiently that it can find its way in the dark by listening to the echoes of its own voice. A porpoise can negotiate a maze at high speed when its eyes are covered. It could play toss and fetch without sight. We don't know exactly how the porpoise makes these sounds. It has no vocal cords. Another animal famous for finding its way by echolocation, the bat. A scientist of sensory systems, Fred Webster, is studying the extreme sensitivity of bat hearing by means of films in which both the action and the sound have been slowed. The bat finds its way to a target by listening to the echoes of its own sound signals, which rapidly increase as it comes closer to the target, a mealworm. Of all laboratory experiments relating to sound, these drawings represent the most important, the most revolutionary. One morning in 1877, Thomas Edison handed these sketches to his shop foreman and said, with no further explanation, build this. On that morning, all sound in the world was live and once made was lost in the air forever. When Edison's engineer finished his assignment, he had built the first machine to store and to reproduce sound. When Edison took his machine to Washington to be patented, he spent an afternoon sitting for Matthew Brady, the photographer of President Lincoln and the Civil War. At this juncture in history were born the means to freeze and hold two aspects of a living moment, sight and sound, so that we can return and in some measure re-experience the past. Edison launched his phonograph, and everybody loved it.
1916, a New Orleans jazz band had to travel 1,400 miles to New York to find what was then a first-class studio for recording. Okay, boys, get ready. From there, on a disc of wax, jazz traveled the world to become the sound of an era. By the 1960s, the best in equipment had moved far beyond the big communication centers. Today, many small cities in America have recording facilities sophisticated enough to offer every aspiring group the ultimate in sound recording. In the sound revolution, the old disc was replaced by magnetic tape. The recording industry exploded and scattered among small groups making new sounds, making sounds on top of sounds, making the distinctive sound of their time. Just about a year ago, I set out on the road, seeking my fame and fortune. Looking for a pot of gold Things got bad and things got worse I guess you know the tune Oh Lord, stuck in a low die again Oh Lord, stuck in a low die again A hundred years after Edison the acoustical world is still in a state of accelerated evolution. For example, we may soon be turning on a gas jet and lighting it to listen to our records. These scientists at the United Technology Center in San Francisco discovered by accident that a flame can do the work of a loudspeaker. How it works, they frankly don't know, but fire may give us, say, musical candles at the dinner table. Another offbeat conductor of sound, apples, or pumpkins for that matter. This apple conducts sound at a higher frequency when it's fresh than it could if there were a rotten spot hidden inside. It's a fresh apple. The new experiments in sound touch upon a wide range of interests, from those of fruit and vegetable farmers to animal behaviorists. In this psychology laboratory, a rat stepping onto the right side of the cage turns on music by Schoenberg. When it moves to the left side, it triggers a recording of Mozart. The results of this study Rats brought up on Mozart prefer Mozart. Rats brought up on Schoenberg display no preference. The conclusion is that Mozart wrote the better music? No, that remains a matter of taste. We do conclude that rats can learn to choose what they want to hear. They can be trained to be selective. Unconscious selectivity in human hearing may be a guardian of our sanity. To a surprising extent, we train ourselves to hear what we want or what we need to hear. This couple manages to turn off or sleep in spite of the sounds of the city outside their window. And yet out of this din, they can select sounds which are important to them. Answering the telephone in the middle of the night is not this wife's duty. It's remarkable that a man's ear can be tuned so finely to the ring of his own phone, even for wrong numbers. Out of pandemonium, a mother selects the cry of her baby.
people can cope with unwanted sound to an amazing degree. The ear-splitting road music of this superhighway floods the surrounding neighborhood. How do people react to this continuous sound? In a study of human tolerance to rising sound levels, environmental scientist Norman Sanders mapped the noise environment along a California freeway. Then he interviewed the occupants of the houses by the side of the road to learn how they felt about the sounds of the world going by. Not bad, most of them said, except for those exhaust brakes blasting at unexpected times and those loudmouthed dogs next door. <laughs> Airplanes can be irritating, flying over at unpredictable times. And so can the roar of motorcycles cutting through the everyday, ordinary din. Many people seem able to roll with the racket and accommodate to an assault on the ear. If it is steady and consistent, In matter of sound and hearing, what is one man's pleasure is another man's pain. Some people need their own personal blanket of sound, to the point of addiction. Some people like loud sounds. Some people like loud sound as an expression of exuberance. Some people make loud sounds to relieve irritation, whatever irritability they cause others. Loud sounds give some people a feeling of power. This picture postcard town is one of the loveliest cities in the world, Rio de Janeiro. It is also the loudest. In Rio, noise is considered simpatico, an expression of good feeling, well-being, delight. Sound is sometimes an element of packaging. It is possible to make quiet motorcycles. But traditionally, the kid on the block with the most formidable sounding bike has enhanced his reputation in his part of the scene. Car manufacturers spend time and money every year to improve techniques of making a door slam sound loud and solid, heavy, dependable, and expensive. The sound that we don't want is called noise. This magnificent machine is a prime producer of a sound that nobody wants, the sonic boom, created when a plane moves faster than the speed of sound. Any object moving through the air pushes molecules ahead of it and out of the way. The pushed molecules push others, and invisible air pressure waves are created. Molecules pushed by an object traveling as fast as the speed of sound cannot move quickly enough to get out of the way. They jam up in a shock wave. If we could see it, it might look like a shallow dish. As a supersonic plane, or a plane moving faster than sound, accelerates, the shock wave forms a cone which travels with the plane as long as the high speed is maintained. When the shock wave reaches the ground, anyone in its path hears a sharp report as it passes. The greatest controversy over noise centers around supersonic aircraft and the sonic boom. Many countries have already passed laws forbidding supersonic flights within their borders. The rest of the world keeps its fingers crossed. For most people, Hearing is a gradually dimming perception. The more so, the more the ears have been used or misused. 
The apparatus of hearing, like lead pencils or ball bearings, wears down with use. Some teenage musicians today have an ability to hear that would be normal for the age of 65. Yet, scientists have found some African tribesmen who go into old age with hearing in the upper frequencies as acute as it was in their youth. It has been estimated that noise in our environment is doubling every decade. At this rate, it may become more than an annoyance and, in the opinion of some environmentalists, pose a real threat to our physical and mental health. Governments promise action. Industry promises reforms. Private organizations exert political pressure. Everyone understands that airport employees wear ear protectors to guard their hearing. Elephants in an English zoo are also earmuffed against the frightening sound of low-flying jets. And the ordinary citizen may have to defend himself as he can. Industrial ear protectors raise no eyebrows on this city street. And it may come to this. Or this. A new glass developed to shut out sound. We may learn to live behind it in relative peace and quiet, with windows permanently closed, to escape sound and preserve hearing.